Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is State Senator Brian Campion, the Chair of Senate Education. It is 1.30 on Thursday, January 14th, and this is the Senate Education Committee. Uh, today, uh, committee members, it's good to see everybody. We are going to continue our tour of uh, getting a sense of what uh, is happening out there on the ground uh, with regard to COVID and get some updates and some introductions uh, and an understanding of some of our additional partners uh, around the state. Uh, yesterday, we had quite a bit of time with the Chancellor of the State Colleges, the President of CCV. Today, we're going to move uh, on with some of our independent colleges. We're also going to uh, hear from school boards later on uh, and after school programs. I've asked uh, Susan, uh, and I believe Susan is here. Susan is the executive director uh, of Vermont Independent Colleges to uh, introduce herself uh, and introduce her colleagues who have joined us today. And I've asked Susan to have each of the independent colleges uh, that are with us to not only uh, to really kick it off by telling us a little bit about themselves as well as their institution. Um, and then uh, we can also get into what they have been seeing on the ground, some of their struggles with COVID. We do know, or some of you may be aware that uh, the legislature allocated some COVID funds to our independent colleges to help with testing. And so I think it'll be interesting as we've heard from other witnesses, what they're seeing, some of their struggles, what they might need as we are right now in this part of the pandemic and hopefully um, going to uh, get back, as we've heard from Dr. Levine and others, some kind of hopefully normalcy um, next fall. Before we, we start that, I do wanna make people aware and this will be something that we'll come back to. If you've not seen the announcement uh, out of Washington, uh, uh, President-elect Biden is talking about um, having students return to classrooms uh, around the country, uh, I think he said after his first 100 days in office. And he talked about uh, the cash that's gonna be needed for that as well as other assistance. Um, we'll get more details on that and we'll hear from folks um, in the coming days as we also continue to try or make good partnerships with the federal administration in addition to our federal delegation. So with that, Susan, I'm going to, unless I see uh, hands for an immediate question from committee members, I am going to turn it over to uh, Susan to introduce herself uh, and uh, hear from our independent colleges. Susan. Thank you. Uh, Susan Stightley uh, with the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges or AVIC. Uh, Senator Campion, Chair Campion, uh, thank you for having me here today, uh, as well as the three college presidents that you'll be hearing from uh, later. I have been working with AVIC for, um, I think it's been 13 years. Uh, so I'm very excited to see this newly formed committee and some new faces on the committee. Uh, I've worked closely with Senate Education and it's been a very good collaboration. Uh, AVIC has 11 uh, members of the 11 private colleges, accredited nonprofit colleges in the state. Uh, and that ranges from Sterling, colleges in Ster Sterling College in the Northeast Kingdom to the South, and you'll be hearing from Bennington College. Uh, but we have a wide and unique set of colleges in the state, and you'll be hearing from Peter Eden. Uh, which is uh, you know, one of a handful of schools in the country that works with students with disabilities and the uh, oldest private uh, military college in the state, uh, Norwich. So I'm pleased that those three presidents can be here today. I also wanna thank you very much for the funding um, that was given to the private colleges last session. Senate Ed was really responsible for getting us the testing dollars uh, five million was set aside for that, and we used a little bit over three million dollars for testing. The, the colleges are going to be increasing their testing this spring. Uh, there'll be more testing, so a lot more costs, and uh, we'll want to discuss that further with you. We also appreciate that the legislature um, allocated ten million dollars to the private colleges through the CRF fund, and I just. Briefly want to talk about the distribution of that money. Uh, 
we had requested that AVID be able to decide how that money was distributed. Normally, federal funds come to the college based on the number of students that they have, the FTE, their full-time equivalency. We really wanted to uh, protect our smaller colleges because that normally means the larger colleges get the biggest share of the money. But AVIC members all worked collaborative and I think it's an excellent example of how close knit this Vermont community of private colleges is. We worked to ensure that the smaller institutions, the ones that had could demonstrate uh, uh, their the, the, what was allowable expenses uh, as related to the CARES, Institute, the CARES Act, that they be reimbursed 100% of what they could, what was allowable. So we had four small colleges that got 100% uh, of the need that they could, that was allowable to be reimbursed. Then we divided the rest amongst the remaining colleges, except that Middlebury College, because they have additional resources, uh, they agreed to take less. Uh, so it was a very equitable distribution. Middlebury took into account that it had an endowment uh, and we really worked to support our smaller schools. So it was a really great process. Um, and I would recommend, and Chris, it will probably need additional support that that um, be the process that we use again. AVIC has also worked very hard on the reopening, uh, of the fall reopening and now the spring. When the pandemic started and the governor appointed um, an economic restart team, he did not have a representative from higher education on the team. We are the third largest industry in the state in terms of salary and wages. So it was vital that we be on that committee. Uh, so I petitioned the governor to get a representative on and the former president of Norwich College had just retired. So he kindly volunteered <laughs> in his first year of retirement to continue working uh, on the restart team. So AVIC worked closely uh, with that team. We drafted the uh, initial uh, governor's guidance for reopening colleges and worked really closely back and forth for several months to get the guidance right. And I think we did, we had a really successful fall reopening and you'll hear more about it and the spring reopening from the president. So I won't go into those details, but the quarantining, the testing, um, the student behavior, we had a student had to sign a health pledge throughout the, the fall semester. I tracked how many uh, violations of the health pledge there were, how many students were removed from campus. We reported that to the governor's team, but the result was that we didn't have any student transmission of COVID to, to any community. Uh, unfortunately, there was an outbreak at St. Mike's, but that was a community transmission to the campus. Uh, but there was no transmission from students uh, to communities. So we feel that was very, very successful. And we also have weekly uh, president's meetings uh, throughout the fall semester. And then we're gonna continue probably every other week in the spring. Those meetings, uh, uh, AVIC organizes them, but we also include the public colleges as well, so that we're all together talking about the problems, the challenges, how we're facing them, and how we can support each other uh, and learn from each other. And we also have um, weekly meetings with the health officials, with Dr. Levine, um, Patsy Kel Kelso, and Tracy Dolan, uh, and we meet every week with them, uh, the healthcare people from all the colleges, public and private, and that, has, that collaboration has been key, again, to a really safe opening uh, for our colleges. So I think the real takeaway is Vermont is very special in that the collaboration amongst the private colleges and the public colleges as well, and it really helps to make our sector strong. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to have more challenges to face this spring, and your support, continued support, is going to be vital to keeping us strong and healthy. So I will turn it over to the presidents unless you have some questions. Sure. If I could just uh, ask one question. How, so you mentioned the equitable distribution. Did AVIC work with that distribution in some way? Were you a point person in any way? How did, how did that all happen? Yeah, I was the lead for bringing the, the CFOs together uh, okay. to, to discuss what model we might use that might be fair. So, you know, we okay. worked through many different scenarios until we felt we came up with the best solution. Terrific, thank you. Uh, committee, questions for Susan before we move on to, and just so folks know, I. Uh, we ran into this difficulty a little bit with Senate Natural Resources and Energy, and I apologize. Sometimes the little hands that people wait, uh, put in the chat or somewhere else, 
they're not being seen easily. Uh, so please uh, feel free to put up your actual physical hand if I'm not calling on you. Okay, great. So uh, we'll turn it over to the presidents. Let's see, Lori, Lori, President Walker, I believe you're first on the agenda. Great, Laura, you're uh, muted. But I, I um, promised, I, I made a, one of my resolutions was to not have to hear you're on mute, <laughs> but I, so I've broken it already. Somebody Thank you just so much. said that that was the most popular phrase that was said in 2020. <laughs> I don't remember who actually uh, said it. Uh, welcome, <laughs> President Walker. And uh, as I think everybody knows here, for complete transparency, uh, I have been an employee at Bennington College uh, for the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, and uh, also for complete transparency, as Senator Chittenden has uh, an incredible alliance, as I think we all do with the University of Vermont, uh, I am a big fan of Bennington's and uh, very pleased that uh, President Walker is with us. And, and still a, a relative, actually still a very new president to Bennington uh, and came in right during the mm -hmm. pandemic. So. Welcome, uh, President Walker. So glad you're here and looking forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much. And um, I did just actually, Brian, just so your fellow committee members know, I got off the phone just recently with a, just the, today with a parent who said uh, her son had taken your class and loved it. Oh, <laughs> so, so he's a good teacher too. Oh, good. So anyway, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate uh, being here and I'm immensely grateful for uh, your leadership, all of you. Uh, you have been uh, an incredible support to all the, uh, the colleges here in uh, Vermont. And it's your leadership, your advocacy, your financial support on behalf of the colleges and students of our institutions uh, that has meant so much. And um, I am, as Brian said, I'm not only a recent um, uh, president of, of, of uh, Bennington, I'm also a recent transplant to Vermont. And I am so proud to be a Vermonter. You, uh, the, the state legislature, the governor, you have taken COVID so seriously and protected the residents of Vermont so well. And I am immensely grateful as a citizen and as a president of a college. Um, I wanna just share uh, very briefly a note that I received from a student of ours, uh, because I think it articulates just how essential our cooperation and collaboration during this pandemic has has been to them. Um, she said, I'm following the health and safety guidelines because I want to stay in school. I don't have another place to go. And that's the case for so many of us students. Um, being in school is so much more for us than just being in school. It's security. It's about having a safe place and having a room and having food. It's a privilege to be here and to be in person. And that's not something I or my friends want to risk in any way. So our students are following these guidelines because they love it here and they want to be here. Um, as many of you know, um, as Brian said, Bennington College is a national liberal arts college located in the southwest corner of the state in Bennington. Um, we have a small but very diverse population of students. We have 21% uh, uh, of uh, our undergraduates actually are the first in their families to attend a four-year college. International students make up about 17%. Uh, and the undergraduate enrollment, the, the full enrollment is about 800. Um, and there are reasons to be hopeful um, about next year's numbers. And that's one of the things I'm really proud of right now, which is that um, it is our track record as in Vermont and in Bennington that has drawn uh, record numbers of, of students applying to Bennington. And so we are very proud of that. And we all need to share in that. Um, in, in that. Um, one of the things that makes Bennington distinct among its peers is its commitment to an experiential student-directed education that provides hands-on preparation for post-college work. Many of our students have been interns um, in Montpelier during a field work term in person often. Uh, uh, we have our field work term is January and February, and this is some of the best work experience they, they get. Um, our, ours was the first liberal arts institution in the nation to integrate classroom study with annual fieldwork uh, experience. 96% um, of Bennington graduates are employed or pursuing continuing ed education within one year of graduation. And these careers involve meaningful work in their desired fields. And I do want to say um, many of our students actually stay in Vermont. And I think that is a really important 
uh, aspect of, of, what, uh, of why independent colleges are so important to Vermont, because people stay, they fall in love, they find connections, uh, and they, they, wanna, uh, they wanna be here. And building a, a population of young people in Vermont is one of the goals we all have. Um, we're a creative, nimble, and innovative institution, um, all of which has served us incredibly well. Um, and the people, uh, I think we've had real success um, just in terms of our COVID numbers. We had uh, only four students. Um, they all came on arrival with COVID. And so we then quarantined them and there's been no other student uh, uh, spread or cases. We have since uh, Thursday, the governor was right in, I mean, I'm sorry, since Thanksgiving, the governor was right and you guys were right that this was gonna be the rough time. We've had about seven cases in the community of, of employees. Some of them are actually working remote and they never come in. And some of them, uh, I think it's about four or five have been on, on campus, um, but not, uh, not near the students. So, so the, the spread has been um, not from employees to students, but employee to employee. And uh, that's one of the things we wanna you know, keep an eye on. Um, uh, but, you know, everyone has been noting um, the success of Vermont, and that is why our domestic applications have increased by about almost 20% this year among undergraduates. Um, so let me just tell you briefly how we've adapted. We had a really uh, fabulous core team working on creating a strategy. Um, we had restrictions on travel, number one. Students arrival to campus began in the third week in August and they were staggered to allow for COVID-19 testing and physical distancing during move-in. Parents weren't even allowed in the, in the dorms um, roughly to, to help move in. Roughly two thirds of the total campus housing capacity was occupied the fall. We we also had uh, about 20% of the students um, were living uh, and participating remotely. Our classes were all pretty much all hybrid classes. So uh, faculty members were um, teaching both uh, to a Zoom class and to students that were in their classes in, in IRL in real life. Um, any student who left campus to visit uh, any place uh, outside of Vermont and in any high, high coast caseload area at the beginning, um, we're not permitted to return. So some people left and then we're, weren't able to come back. Um, and we were following the Vermont guidelines uh, to a T. Um, we expect to follow similar protocols. Um, we had comprehensive testing upon arrival. And uh, then if students, uh, they could uh, quarantine at home in their, uh, if they were driving in and they, many of them quarantined at home and then took a test on arrival and then stayed in their rooms until they got a negative test. Um, and we will do that again. Um, I think that the key to our success has been uh, the weekly testing uh, that we've done. And it's interesting, I was, uh, I think that it's not just that we know whether there are cases uh, every, uh, you know, all the time, if there's a case, because during the, the um, term when we're in session, uh, students can get tested Monday through Friday and they each have a day and they get it usually within um, 24 hours. We do it through the Broad Institute. Um, but it also, I think, adds another level of kind of shared responsibility. Everyone knows they're going to get tested. So uh, it actually helps, I think, people uh, follow and be extra careful. Um, we are indebted to, uh, to Broad for their, their excellent testing and for your support of that testing, because uh, as I said, it's, it's so important. Um, in addition to the testing, all students, faculty, and staff are required to self-screen daily to confirm that their temperature is under 100 um, and to report any symptoms. Um, and uh, we also provide transparent reporting. If you go to our website, it looks at, um, it, tell, it will tell you how many cases we have. It will tell you uh, other like violations and other things. We wanna be very transparent. I've been communicating to the whole community every Monday, um, which I think has been really uh, welcome. We've also reimagined campus spaces. Every physical space on campus has been reimagined in accordance with state distancing guidelines. The on-campus faculty and staff population has been calibrated to comply with social distancing and capacity requirements. And most importantly, in some ways, is the promise to one another. Every student, faculty, and staff member uh, using campus is required to sign a commitment of shared responsibility. And this is uh, 
it, it, it uh, lays out kind of the um, adherence and the promise to adhere to the state of Vermont's safe and healthy return to campus mandatory guidance, um, as well as some of additional requirements we have for mask wearing, physical distancing, health screening, travel restrictions, and more. And anyone who refuses to sign the CSR is not permitted on campus. We have not also allowed people from outside the community uh, uh, to come on campus, except for our um, wonderful neighbors who are allowed to walk their dogs. I think Senator Sears walks his dog um, on our campus every day. Um, but uh, people are not allowed in the in the buildings, or unfortunately, because we're missing that that wonderful interaction. Um, but I, I just want to uh, close by um, saying we are incredibly um, proud. We are incredibly. Um, uh, grateful to you and to everyone who has helped. The uh, additional expenses for all of COVID, we estimate are gonna be over 8 million. Um, this includes about 1.3 million in room and board refunds in the uh, last spring that we didn't, um, uh, that we didn't get. So it's lost revenue and additional expenses. And so we're, you know, we're still trying to, to make up and this is gonna be something that goes into the next, uh, year. Um, and so this is this is tough uh, for us. And, and it is really wonderful to see both your support and the support that uh, Susan, who has done a fabulous job, I think, on behalf of all the AVIC uh, colleges, not only in providing us with information and context, but in creating a really shared spirit of we're all in this together. Um, so I uh, the, th the third thing I just want to um, say before I, I um, close is um, we are all in a unique position and um, uh, Vermont and it's uh, has lived up to its um, reputation as being bucolic and beautiful, but also I had no idea um, what a strong and wonderful community this is. And um, uh, one just last additional thing I do wanna mention is that as I, I was, um, thinking and talking to my staff the other day and uh, talking about what are the challenges that our students are facing. And um, there are, I think, among all of the colleges, you know, some uh, new kind of mental health challenges among students uh, because of COVID. And I think it's important for us all to, uh, you know, be aware of uh, what kind of support our students need. And I am, we are grateful for the uh, the lifting of the restrictions so that out-of-state therapists can uh, provide service for people who are, for students and, and community members who are out-of-state. And I know that uh, that expires at the end of March, and uh, we hope that that will be extended. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I am so grateful for your time today and your ongoing help, and look forward to answering any questions or just being a part of this community. Thank you, President Walker. Uh, questions? Uh, Senator Hooker. I do, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, President Walker. Uh, a couple of questions. First of all, your, your students went home for vacation, and when will they, are they back? Or when will they be coming back? And what percentage of them will be coming back? Yeah, so 80% came to campus in the fall. We expect that to be actually a little higher in the spring. Um, so some students who were at uh, home are going to be coming uh, back to campus because they uh, they realized how what a great experience it was. Um, and uh, some new students, I think we have 12 or 15 uh, new freshmen who are coming in the middle of the year, they deferred and, uh, and some transfer students that are coming. Um, so what we did is we originally had uh, said that they would stay and we would continue hybrid classes through December 11th, which was the end of the term. But when Governor Scott's uh, guidance came out before Thanksgiving, we went all remote. Um, so all classrooms were remote. We encouraged people to leave. Some of them left. Some of them didn't want to leave until for another couple of weeks. We didn't force them out. But uh, there are some students still on campus right now, the international students who have no place to go. Uh, but we will be, uh, I think we start on February 12th um, and people will be returning uh, in a staggered way uh, in the two weeks before that. 
Okay, and just out of curiosity, with regard to their self-screening, do you provide thermometers for each of the students? And is oh. that part of the CARES fund? I mean, was that paid for through that? If they if they need it, we do. But most students are, are bringing the thermometers. And we do have a um, an app on the phone. So it's really easy uh, to, to enter it in and to report your symptoms. And it's, you know, you report your temperature. You also report if you have uh, a headache. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just say something about the app. So since I'm on it, you know, I, right now I get tested every Monday if I want to be on campus at all, go to campus, you know, a quick test, and then you get a text about, I don't know, 12, 14 hours later saying that hopefully that you're negative. And then every day you, you go through and just take a look at the symptom list and see if you have any symptoms. So it, for those institutions and people that are out there that aren't using that kind of technology, I just have to say, it's been absolutely uh, incredible, really incredible. Uh, other questions or comments? Uh, one thing I'm wondering is, you mentioned that mental health professionals, uh, it sounds like at one point during the pandemic were not allowed over state lines and then there was a, a waiver I'm just looking for some clarification. Yeah, I'm, you know what, I- uh, now, You have the chair uh, health and welfare with us in the corner, Senator Lyon, I, uh, ah. might also be able to weigh in on this. Yes, uh, and Susan, maybe you can help. My understanding is that uh, as part of one of Governor Scott's early, uh, or, or the uh, one of the early um, policies, uh, I think it was at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, he lifted the restrictions so anyone uh, who had an out-of-state license could give teletherapy over state lines. And that goes until March 31st of 2021. So as we look at, um, we have some, uh, some students that have out-of-state therapy and we are also uh, trying to um, you, you know, uh, create an online community so that there can be more. So we, those students need to, and the therapists need to have the, uh, the permission to be able to do that. I can follow up with the specifics. I, I, no, Susan, I, think, I, I, I think Senator Lyons in the corner uh, and Senator Lyons, you should know, President Walker has also been to campus over the years through Kappa, has weighed in on healthcare issues and other things. And she's the chair of health and welfare. And I think she might, uh, be able to shed some light on this. Ah, terrific, thank you. Yes, this is great to hear actually because I'm introducing a bill that's going to extend the timeline on that. So right. the the telemedicine and the overstate lines for, um, for folks is really very important. And I'm happy to hear that A, it's worked, but also B, that it's a need going forward. So um, thank you. Thanks Thank that. you. Yeah. <laughs> That's great yeah, news. Yeah. Thank you. As soon as uh, the bill is being written now, and, and actually, uh, just as a, a quick update, when we wrote the bill and we put in the timelines, we, it, we deliberately didn't end it with December 2020 mm -hmm. because we knew we might be seeing some needs. Yeah. So what what you have just said validates yes. <laughs> our thinking, but now we can go ahead. So yeah. thanks, well, thank thanks you. so and much. Thank you. And it's a it's an uh, a deeper question about how does Vermont, how do we work together to increase the amount of mental health services? And I was just talking to Tom D about that the other day. So thank you. Well, it, yes, it's very interesting. And, and how much of this needs to be more permanent and more exactly. permanently in place? You, yeah. You're absolutely right. Thank you Excellent so question. much. Question, yeah. Other questions? Seeing none, uh, we will move on to, uh, we'll go back to Susan. Thank you, President Walker. Uh, Susan, who would you like to have uh, next? Uh, thank you. Uh, and I believe uh, President uh, Mark Anaruma from uh, Norwich is next. And we see he's traveling, but that usually doesn't stop him. Okay, terrific. Hello, thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'll start with my expression of profound gratitude. You know, I, I got here on June 1st, along with President Walker of last year, and not the way you'd want to start a presidency, certainly, but it certainly was uh, 
uh, rising to the challenge helps define the nature of your institution. So I've been very, very fortunate. And I'll start my comments by saying I, I arrived partly in anticipation of being in competition with my fellow presidents, but uh, it was not that at all from the first day. It's been fully collaborative, supportive. They've been a wonderful community of peers for me and advisors, and I'm very grateful for all of them and for Susan's great work in leading me through uh, my first year here, although the person I replaced went to work for the governor, Rich Schneider, of course, and he's been a trusted friend ever since my arrival. So Norwich University, of course, is uh, very unique. It's, uh, it's the nation's oldest senior military college. It's the original one. It's the birthplace of ROTC. It was founded by a person who left the West Point in 1819 because he wanted to make sure the United States military had an officer corps that was representative of our nation. So farmers, factory workers, et cetera, and not just for the elite. So that of course resonates today very powerfully. So there were senior military college in its founding. We have a very robust civilian population. We have two lifestyles. There is the uh, Corps of Cadets, which is our foundational senior military college identity. We also have a very uh, a growing civilian population and students do choose their own lifestyle and they can move to one or the other once they arrive. So we build out a freshman class and we see other lifestyles um, do shake out. And we tend to have uh, graduates that perform at a much higher level than peer institutions across the country. There are six total senior military colleges. We're the only one in the North and we are the only one that now is also in the West. We have our main campus in Northfield, Vermont but we have satellite campuses in Denver, Colorado, and Berlin, Germany. And we're gonna be expanding our international footprint. Uh, that's part of our strategic plan for the next five years. Um, so very proud of our performance, of course, over the fall. And some of the unique features of the school that I do wanna share that help lend to that success. You know, we, we have several, we have three identified centers of excellence. Um, a global resiliency center, a peace and war center, and a cyber center. Um, our global resiliency focuses on climate change and how that affects public policy, and, and they are exceptional. We host several international conferences every year uh, along that topic. In addition to the three centers, we have something called the Norwich University Applied Research Institute, or NUARI. And Nuari is very heavily involved with uh, Senator Leahy's staff, especially, and he's now going to be the chair of the Appropriations Committee under the Biden administration. So we're very excited about that partnership, uh, bearing even more fruit. But we are in execution of many government contracts at Norwich uh, through that Nuari vehicle. So uh, those are some unique features of the school. I'll be happy to fill in any blanks if people have, uh, have questions here at the end. But talking through our numbers and how proud I am of the fall term, uh, we did decide to go um, in person. We incentivized folks to stay home because uh, our model is very reliant upon experiential learning and person instruction. We have a very uh, active uh, fitness program, of course. We had the Payne Mountain Trails and the Shaw, Out the Shaw Outdoor Center, which integrates with the town of Northfield. We have uh, confidence courses outside, et cetera. Um, we have rooks or freshman cadets, and there's a, a heavy physical component. We, we were able to do all of that through the course of the fall semester. We um, executed 16,875 COVID tests during the course of the fall term, um, and we only yielded 16 positive cases from that. And three had never set foot on campus, but we counted them against our numbers. And I'll explain how we got to that point in a second. But uh, we had a very deliberate arrival process. It was spread over the course of several days. Parents were allowed to drop off, leave equipment, leave the um, uh, belongings on the sidewalk, and then the individuals go to the room. We didn't allow anyone non-students inside the, the buildings. We did a forced quarantine on campus for a full week until we can get a second negative COVID test. We paid our employees to work from home or put them on paid administrative leave if they couldn't work from home, so we didn't punish our uh, employees for uh, from something out of their control. One of the things I'm most proud of as my as a president in my first term, despite all these challenges, we're able to get through the semester and now currently sit in the same good situation. Not a single layoff, not a single furlough. We fully funded all benefits and we actually funded the increase in healthcare premiums. So we, we, I, we I came in and used the phrase to keep the Norwich family together. You know, many institutions are not able to do such a, such a thing, but um, I'm very fortunate that we were able to do so. So like I said, with the 16 cumulative uh, cases, we also had a full sports athletics program. We stayed internal but our student athletes were able to compete, stay current, and our swim and diving coach did a very creative idea of having a virtual swim meet with some competitor institutions where they swam for time live against other schools swimming for time on their own campuses. That was very creative. Uh, Norwich has a, a actual national champion uh, hockey program, men and women. 
And uh, we're very proud of them. And we're going to see how we can possibly compete through the winter and spring term, of course, only doing so uh, safely. One of the ways we're able to achieve such success with the low infection rates and, um, and we had zero spread, which is the most important thing, is uh, we have a, what we've, we've achieved what we call the quadruple redundancy surveillance system. So you start with your, your app-based symptom tracker. It's, that's 100% faculty, staff, and students. And uh, they self-report, or we incentivize the students. If you have a single symptom, you stay in your room, you make the call, we send the nursing staff to your room, they, they give you an evaluation, and then you um, are either released or you stay there until we get your test back. We also put aside 70 dorm rooms or, or bed spaces and we have a facility off campus now that has 16 bed space. It's a, it's a private home that we renovated. So if we do have a single a, a symptom or we have a test that comes back as, um, as inconclusive, we'll move the student to that area to reduce the potential of the threat. So we have the symptom tracker, as I said, we have passive temperature sensors around campus. So when it walks past, much like the Burlington Airport, you have the camera and it'll say, here's the form walking by that you're temperature. Then we can pull reports from there and say, uh, did we have a temperature spike in these given areas around campus? Then we can target surveillance testing more aggressively. So that's the second redundancy. The, um, the actual physical testing, uh, we last term we did, everyone got it every three weeks at a minimum. If they wanted to do more often, they did. Anyone competing in athletics or the military training curriculum got it every week. So we did get through the fall term with obviously the 16,875 tests. Uh, this semester, we're starting with 100% faculty, staff, and students will get the test every week. So we're going to be more robust coming out of the gate, and then we'll see if we can back it off if the data supports such a thing. So that's a third level we're done to see. The fourth is what I might be most um, proud of in this whole uh, COVID nightmare, because we did try to leverage the crisis to be uh, a better institution and to leverage our talent better. So we started a wastewater, wastewater surveillance system. It's called wastewater-based epidemiology. So basically we go into the manholes, we grab wastewater, and then we can sample the wastewater, see if there's traces of the virus. And we started to do it as a test base and we had our senior students in capstone engineering studies build the auto samplers. We had a PhD holding faculty member supervising, a PhD pursuing chemistry faculty member actually creating the test to look for the um, actual viral presence at an RNA level. And then we had communication students writing the stories around it. And we had the facility operations, of course, access in the manholes. Tremendous success story and very proud of it. So we're able to do a proof of concept. We did catch the virus in an area we knew it already existed through our testing. Then we brought it to the town of Northfield. And we went to the wastewater treatment plant there. We worked with the town, put it in. We detected the virus there, but they had their outbreak already. So as we go into the spring semester, we will have those auto samplers in multiple locations around Northfield so they can pinpoint future infections. And now we had a tie, we have it tied to every dormitory on campus. So if there are traces of wastewater, we'll be able to close, close that dorm down, do 100% testing, put them on quarantine and building only, and hopefully get ahead of any outbreak. So very proud of the w, WBE is what we're calling it. So wastewater-based epidemiology. So that's the quadruple redundancy we've achieved. So we're very proud of all these initiatives and um, you know, the, the team has done uh, very, very well. Uh, student behavior, of course, we had the maroon and gold contract. And I, I did get prickly with a reporter. I gave her a nice story and she said, well, of course you guys did well, you're, you're a military school. I said, well, no, you know, it's still 18 to 22 year old kids and we have to you know, uh, make sure they're behaving the right way. We have a lot of civilians. It's about institutional values. We got them to buy into the institutional values and responsibility and they did do their part of the bargain. I'm very proud of the students. Um, the experience was quite good. We did a lot more than people thought we could. And uh, every year they run the river, the Dog River, and I went first and it was quite unpleasant, but we did a while, you know, fully protected. We were uh, exercising in a field wearing the masks. Not how it could have been, but we got to pull it off and we did our other training um, areas. Uh, the trans full transparency wanted to make North feel very comfortable. They were uncomfortable at first. I went to select boards. I briefed every week, gave them, them our numbers. I heard their concerns. We were very responsive. And we we created a dashboard on our website that was interactive and you could peel back number of tests, number of positives, um, et cetera. It was an interactive bar graph and uh, that will be up and running uh, by next week because we are already receiving students. So I'll go into that uh, reception now. We started today. Uh, really, it's gonna go Friday through Monday, but today are the early arrivals that fly in from out of state. We do have students from all 50 states and 27 countries. 
that number 27 will go into the mid 50s uh, by the time uh, by this time next year, if I have my way. So we are truly an international campus, but we do represent uh, a national sample of traditional students. Uh, so they're they're coming in, they get dropped, or they park their car, and they go to the room, they drop their things, they go get their initial um, evaluation. We have a wonderful nursing program, Dr. Paulette Thibault, who is involved with the state very well. She oversees it. Our nursing students help administer the tests. So you show up, you go down, you get your initial test, you isolate in your room until you get your negative test back. So uh, you can get food, we deliver food if you need to stay in your room. And then everyone goes into campus quarantine after the initial negatives, after probably 48 hours or so after arrival. And then the whole campus goes again on a campus quarantine until everyone gets their seven day negative. And then we will start integrating back. We started in-person instruction last Monday. We will start in-person instruction and hybrid instruction on February 2nd. That is our delivery plan. If we can teach a class, we're letting the faculty drive their, their modality. If they're comfortable teaching in person, we've, we, we have incentivized uh, them to do so. We have to flex the We clean the um, classrooms very thoroughly, et cetera. If they choose to teach online, we encourage that. Many are doing a hybrid model. If we could push more to online, it de-densifies the instructional space. So it's just safer for everybody. So. Um, it, it kind of hurt us a little bit because we did incentivize. We gave a $4,500 uh, gift to students that chose to stay home voluntarily to achieve de-densification. And we didn't use triples and quads. We had doubles, no more than doubles and some singles. Singles are concerning them be for mental health. I came here from the Air Force Academy where I was a director of a center and a, per, and a full professor. And we had uh, two suicides in 36 hours after the initial isolation rule. So to avoid that, we wanna make sure we deal, deal with isolation. So one thing I did right away last August was we plussed up our counseling and wellness center from six to eight mental health professionals and both of the new hires were very proficient in telemedicine and ensuring that our students were getting mental health services that they deserve. So. That is the high level things that I wanted to make sure that I could share. Oh, that's um, and I'm Very ha helpful. happy to take questions. Uh, Thank Senator you. Lyons. So your last comment really uh, piqued my interest. How did you uh, find mental health counselors to hire or are they, were they military personnel or are they private sector? Uh, it, it really sounds like an amazing event to me. So we were for, I saw, I showed up with the scar tissue of what the, the tragedies I just had endured in Colorado. So um, my first, my first action as president was to tell the human resources to do a national search for two new hires in our counseling wellness center. And we had an applicant pool in the thirties and we did a full screening. And then uh, we did, we were able to receive them at the beginning of the fall term. So it was a national recruitment effort and we found them no military affiliation, traditional higher ed uh, expertise in the counseling realm. But, uh, and one, we wanted to make sure as we're internationalizing, we're also diversifying our student population and faculty and staff. And we did hire someone who's a native level proficiency in Spanish. So that, that enabled us to provide higher level of service to our underserved uh, students. So that worked out very well. Está bien. <laughs> See, <wait. laughs> right. Senator Taranzini. Oh, thank you for uh, for that. Uh, and um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, you do not have to be uh, a student. Does not have to be enrolled in a branch of the military to be a student at Norwich. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. A matter of fact, and I really appreciate that question. Uh, most of our kids that go through the core of cadet experience do not go in the military. It's a lifestyle, teach them discipline. And it's funny because parents, we can all, uh, well, Susan and Laura and I can cry through ourselves. Parents are now very involved with presidents. Some will call me at nine o'clock at night on my personal cell phone. How they got my number, I have no idea. But they do tend to bulldoze and helicopter their students. And we ask them, just let us develop your son and daughter and they'll come home to you more resilient and, and better. And there is a profound um, amount of data about how well the core cadet graduates do perform in the public sector, the private sector, wherever they do land, if it's not in the military. See, our core cadets, now we do have ROTC students, obviously, where the birthplace of RTC, right? But um, most of our cadets go into uh, normal careers that are not uniform uh, related. Well, thanks again for your presentation and to uh, uh, President Walker as well. Nice, nicely, nicely done. I look forward to the next one. Yeah, thank you. I, I do. If there's no other questions, but I'll be happy to keep taking them. I know we have a graduate 
I'm sorry, Senator Hooker, did you want to yes, answer something? Go ahead. I do, Mr. President. Um, just what percentage of your kids are in the Corps of Cadets as opposed to the civilian lifestyle? It's a 50... 58% right now are the, in the core of cadets. Okay. Now, our programs that will be growing will probably have it, like in the health sciences, for example, our nursing program really is world class and we plan on expanding it. So we expect that proportion to kind of bounce around based upon programmatic appeal. And also outside investment, we're working on more scholarship opportunities. So we'll see where it goes. The, the goal was 70 30, but right now we're at 58% core and we'll see what's pragmatic. Okay, and another question with regard to commuters. I don't know how many mm -hmm. commuters um, private colleges have, and how do you handle that when you do? So maybe um, any of you could uh, perhaps address that that question. So we do have a uh, commuter population. Northfield does not have a lot of uh, off-campus housing available, but the sports teams tend to become commuters, and I'm using quotes. So we'd be in the um, we'll be in the high dozens on commuter population, but we do force them to do the symptom tracker in the morning. They come through the temperature sensors and they have to take part in our, uh, in the actual physical broad, uh, uh, nasal testing protocols. And they can't enter a physical space until they produce the proof that they've done the symptom tracker. And we do track if people, so we did have a student that didn't want to take the test, missed two, and they would dismiss from campus. So we were very stringent on the uh, expectation for that level of um, uh, participation in keeping the school open. And I was most proud uh, some of our, one of our senior female students who wanted to be in a leadership position for that year, she coined the phrase, wear your mask so I can wear my uniform. And the self-policing that was achieved by the students really is where I think we turned the tide. It was pretty exceptional. Right. President Walker, commuters, I, I'm not. We, we, I guess there are two kinds of commuters. One is students who move off campus and become commuters. And we have a few of those, you know, maybe 2% of the population. The other is, you know, uh, people who live in Vermont who want to come to Bennington. And that's an area that we want to increase. And through affiliation agreements with community college and other, uh, you know, uh, other ways to get uh, adult learners and other people. We do have community members who are taking classes at, at Bennington. And we love that. Uh, most of them, in fact, the, the um, environment has helped us increase that, which has been terrific. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you both. Uh, uh, President Eden, is it pronounced Eden? Am I getting it correctly, Peter? Yes, thank you. Terrific. All right. Well, welcome, and uh, we'll uh, turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Let me start at the end, okay? Sure. Thank you all so much. Not just myself, but all of the families and all the students who are able to attend Landmark College and the 200 employees who are able to keep their jobs. I don't need to tell you all of the crisis facing Southern Vermont with small colleges uh, going under. A um, Little bit about myself. Uh, my background is in molecular and cellular biology. I worked in the biotechnology industry before making a shift. Everybody thought I was crazy. I made a shift to higher education and um, it was the best thing I've ever done. I can't believe I had the guts to do it. Um, you know, the saying, you know, that which you possess is that which possesses you. I, I didn't possess too much back then. I guess I was young enough, but I made that switch and it was a professor, a dean, and now it, starting in 2011 came up to Landmark College, which makes me, right, Susan, the longest serving private college president in Vermont? I think so. So when I came to Landmark College, Susan mentioned Landmark College is one of a handful of colleges that services students with disabilities. Um, somewhat true. We're only, we're one of two colleges in the nation that has a devoted, dedicated model for students with learning differences. We don't call them disabilities necessarily. We serve only students with dyslexia, ADHD, autism, executive function challenges. These are smart, college capable, maybe not college ready, but college capable students. That's our thing. When I came in 2011, uh, not to dance on the departed, my predecessor did a fabulous job, but we were a two year school, which is a misnomer, you know, an associate degree granting college with two programs. And I dare say a little bit like the bad medicine your mom makes you take. Students went there for a reason because of their LD. Well, what we did 
is we realize students must have pride. We need an alumni base. So we immediately implemented baccalaureate programs. So today we have associate degree programs. We have short-term programs in the summer. We have a growing online enterprise, including starting a micro campus in the Bay Area to support our online programming for those in the area. And we have growing numbers of bachelor's degree programs. So um, we are at once unique in a specialty college, yet also traditional. We know that, you know, your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. For us, it's LD. We change lives, parents love us. Not every student coming out of high school wants more special ed. They don't grow up thinking I'm gonna to go to a special ed college. But now because we have everything every other college has, including sports, internships, study abroad, everything, and we try to remove the stigma from having an LD, they're starting to realize that this place is just engineered for me. It's really ahead of its time. And so it's a wonderful thing, but we are, we are very small. But I don't like to say small, I say optimally sized during my open house sessions and everything, but we have 400 residential students. And as I mentioned, 200 employees. Um, this college, even though we're a niche unique college, don't forget Green Mountain College, they were also a niche unique college and they didn't make it. You have to have sound business practices. We have a tiny endowment of $24 million, but we have an endowment. And now we're growing an alumni base. And now the notion of neurodiversity, learning differently, being autistic, it's losing its shame and stigma. I, I dare say the risk is it's being romanticized on television a bit, that you're automatically a genius, but it's losing its stigma a little bit. Nevertheless, not every student you know, wants to attend a college that focuses on LD. So that's why we provide on-ramps and off-ramps, short-term programs, maybe an associate, stay for a bachelor's degree if you want. We have to provide all these options so that parents can get the students to come to campus, see how great it is, see how cool the other students are and give us a chance. Once they come, our yield and our retention is fantastic. We have retention rates almost 90% for our baccalaureate programs and almost 70% for our associate degree programs. The challenge is, as beautiful as Vermont is, come to a rural campus that focuses on LD. So that's our thing and that's, and that's our brand. Now, um, we started in the spring with the usual um, uh, sorts of de-risking that all the other colleges have done. Um, the students all had to go home for a while. We had to pivot quickly for online learning. Thank goodness we started about eight years ago with our online programming and uh, baked into the cake of those are our scaffolding and support systems for students that have LD. So we, have, we had a little bit of an advantage there, but the campus is where they want, where they want to be. Nevertheless, they stuck with us. We were, I think, the first college in Vermont to have a summer program, very small, tightly managed, and that went really, really well. Um, much as my, my uh, colleagues here have said, we started the fall with, with a very careful the testing, hypervigilance, masking, distancing, got great compliance from our students. We really, really did. And um, I, I have to say now that I, I'm always saying this, but it drives me a little crazy when people focus entirely on students like they're radioactive like they are the disease vectors. We've got 200 faculty and staff coming and going. They're a bigger risk than the students, almost 96% of whom live on campus. So I always push back when people talk about students. They're not the ones going to the gas station that night, going into the store that night. So we have to be mindful of that. But our employees, based on the evidence of our testing, we had only a few positives. So we, of course, followed the regulations. We had isolation, contact, uh, quarantine, one student, and this individual also came to campus with uh, the infection. Uh, they were all in asymptomatic. Um, he broke the rules and we had to send him home. And that was, that was very difficult, but you know, you do the right thing, you never make the wrong decision, but it broke my heart a little bit because it, it's not great to be in isolation when you're an 18 year old freshman, your first time in college, but he still broke the rules and we had to do it. It was a tough call, but the right one to make. Um, we've lost revenue. Uh, we had great retention from the students who were at Landmark College, but the brand, the new student cohort for the fall, having never seen how, the, how robust our resources are because students are all at risk academically, um, they'd never been there. So we had about you know 30% not go to any college 
uh, they didn't want to send their, their son or daughter across, across the country or live in a dormitory. It doesn't matter how small the dormitories are. So um, we lost revenue there. We lost revenue with our summer programs. We shifted some students online who, who needed it and we lost room and board revenue. We had to return room and board revenue. We've had testing expenses. And all of this has been helped by the support of the state of Vermont. Um, as I mentioned up front, we, we, we've kept jobs. And um, we realize how fraught things are with small colleges in New England, especially Vermont. Um, we're just too important a college with the students we serve, with this silent epidemic, which is learning differences and autism to go under. So we're not going to, but we need all the help we can get. I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. That's very helpful. Um, questions, I see Senator Terenzini, please. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Senator Campion. I, uh, President Eden, I appreciate you mentioning uh, Green Mountain College. I think Senator Hooker and I can agree that uh, Rutland County over the last couple of years has suffered greatly with the loss of uh, the College of St. Joseph's and Green Mountain College. Those were uh, good paying jobs with benefits. Those were students who were here from all over the world um, to help uh, grow our economy. Uh, and uh, unfortunately those two colleges for one reason or another uh, have closed their doors. So it's, it's critically important um, that we see all of, uh, all of your colleges uh, uh, succeed and excel and grow for the future. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited that um, you're all here today so we can hear what's happening on your campus in real time. And, and I know now as a freshman senator, you know, a little bit more and what can I do for the future to help you through this committee. So I appreciate your comments uh, 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 as well as the other presidents. Thank you very much. I couldn't have said it better. I think Senator Terenzini said it perfectly. We, we understand, we're, first of all, we're so grateful you're part of the landscape of Vermont. Uh, not only, of course, what you offer uh, first and foremost to your students, but also what you offer to the greater communities. You are economic development drivers. You assist our towns in so many ways. You offer cultural events. You, you, know, you really can become, as many of you are, uh, you know, hubs of culture and education in your communities. And we're so grateful for that. And as Senator Terenzini uh, said, we also recognize the, the landscape of higher education is at one of its most challenging, if not its most challenging uh, point in history. And uh, we hope you'll continue to reach out to us and communicate with us um, and partner with us as we navigate this time with you. That's terrific. Uh, uh, other questions, Senator Hooker, please. Yes, thank you. And thank you, President Eden. Um, yesterday, we talked a little bit about, uh, it sounded like teacher-student ratio in, in uh, the public schools. And, and um, the comment was made that, you know, the lower, the better for, for the kids, the fewer the students and more teachers. I'm curious, with a, with a student body of 400, um, with a uh, staff of employees of 200, I'd be interested in knowing what the um, distribution of those employees is. And, and you can do that and send it to us, uh, but it's, you know, it sounds great, you know, two to one. I mean, it, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, about 70 of the employees are faculty members and about 130 are staff. And a lot of the staff are for direct student support. You know, these students, they're smart, um, but their ADHD is so extreme um, of course, not all colleges have students with dyslexia, ADHD, and autism. We know that. But they're at Landmark College for a reason, because it's significant enough that it gets in the way of their success. They need support out of the classroom, sometimes with social pragmatics. The social aspects, um, and, and I don't call them soft skills, but other skills and strategies needed for success in life. Um, but in the classroom, sure, maybe six students in a class. We have classes of 12. We also have classes of four. Um, and we use a universal design approach. We know there's heterogeneity in the classroom. We may have students with dyslexia. We may have students with autism. And um, we often have autistic students, and that's not their LD. Their LD is ADHD. It, it's, it's, it's highly complex. That's why we call it neurodiversity. But we do have tremendous support for them in and out of the classroom. But we do not infantilize them. This is a legitimate college. It drives me crazy when people say real college because, you know, we are a real college. We, we, we have standards. I've been at three institutions and I've never seen so little grade inflation as I do at Landmark, probably because we know the stakes are high. 
for these kids. If we just see them through and they transfer to uh, any place, Ivy League school or community college, and if we didn't really test them and give them skills and strategies, they will fail and we'll lose our reputation. So it's really quite, it's quite rigorous at the college, but they get a lot of ch chances as well. You know what it really is? We talk about the science and the art, universal design and everything. A lot of it is the fact that it's all we do. This is not a program. There's no shame. I'm in the program like I was in high school. Every student has rolled the same boulder up the mountain. They never have to hope for the right calculus professor because everyone gets it. And when they come onto campus, they realize, wow, this place is built for me and I don't have to worry about having a deficit. Then they blossom. Mm -hmm. Challenge for us is to get them to come to rural Vermont at our price. And I'm, and I'm comfortable talking about our price tag. We are extremely expensive. When I came in, we were the, the most expensive college in the nation. It was us, NYU and Sarah Lawrence. And my board chair sent his kid to Landmark and then Sarah Lawrence. So he joked about how much it cost him for, for college for his kid. But we're a nonprofit. We don't make a nickel. As a matter of fact, we've struggled with deficits the last five years or so. So our price is $74,000 a year. It's enormous. Do we give away scholarship? Absolutely, as much as we can. A net price, the average amount paid is not too different from a lot of other colleges. And I think this is one of the reasons why you don't see more colleges. It costs a fortune to run a college like this for these smart kids who are not going to get a college education and they're not gonna fill all of the, all of the needs in, in society and industry because they won't graduate. We have to support them and it costs a lot of money. So those, those things work against us when we have people looking for colleges. I have, I have no problem talking about that. And, and, and honestly, uh, um, there, now we're, I think we're the 35th most expensive college. We don't put that on a bumper sticker either, trust me, okay? Mm -hmm. But we've done our best to keep the price down, but it still costs a lot for this model and it challenges us in many ways. But we're trying to raise a lot of money for scholarship and we've had a great success with fundraising. Thank you. Susan, is, do, do you in any way as the executive director uh, partner with economic development or tourism as they sort of market Vermont, if you will? Is there a role there for, the, for uh, our independent institutions? To be honest. Um, and it might I, not even make sense, but I'm just curious. No, I have tried. And for several years, I did attend uh, the service of marketing uh, monthly meetings, uh, trying to drive home to them how important we are uh, to tourism and bringing people into the state. Yeah. And not that they don't understand that, but, but um, they, I, I couldn't get them to promote us more. They did some, but we did manage to get them to put, you know, when they developed their website to put colleges on there. Mm -hmm. I want to I want it to, you know, they, they have like work, learn and play or something. I want it to be, you know, work, learn and study um, so th that we were more upfront. But uh, we have worked with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think more can be done. I think it, they should be marketing us much more. Well, sure. And even to be thinking about Vermont as a whole, as the education state, pre-K, you know, through post-secondary with regard, you know, and even as we move more and more, you've heard that the governor and, and all of us here are very interested in, in you know, expanding access to early childhood, childcare, uh, early, ch uh, early childhood education. And so for us to, to be thinking about Vermont as, a, as an education state, I think uh, would be terrific. Uh, uh, President Eden? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is easier said than done, but uh, you know, the, 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 I remember being in some of these meetings with Susan and they talked about, well, you know, what's our brand in Vermont? The rugged, you know, the rugged intellectual. You know, and it's a great, a great place lifestyle. And that's, that's fine. But the real problem is having people stay and having enough talent to work. Yet, what do you have? You have, you have an, a, you have an educational network with students whose students and the parents, they're pragmatic. They demand career readiness. They want internships. If we could plug these students, if we could get serious about career readiness and in integrating these students before they graduate into all of the slots that need it to, to, save uh, economy in, in Vermont mm -hmm. and populate it with students, they will then stay. I'll tell you, it's all about value. That sounds so trite. Parents these days, especially at Landmark, they come here worried about, is she gonna pass calculus finally? She will, and then they're worried about a job. 
if you can get them into a job early on with internship, it will help us recruit students better and it'll still populating all of your new and nascent industries in Vermont. It's very easy to say that, sounds very pat, tough to do, but it's, it's sitting right under our nose. Use our students to help our industries. Mm -hmm. Then they will stay because there'll be jobs and around and around it'll go. Thank you. Uh, all right, just looking at the clock, I'm just looking for final comments, final questions from either the presidents uh, or uh, committee members or Susan. I, I just want to say, you know, I continually try to drive home to the governor who uh, you know, talks about bringing youth to the state. We are key, if not the number one Absolutely. reason why Absolutely. young people move here. And finally, uh, you know, when Green Mountain College closed, you know, a, a high official recognized, oh, we had this captive audience and we let them go. Um, so that's why continued support from the state uh, is, I think, vital. Great. Thank you all. Oh, sorry, President Walker. I was just going to add the the other piece that um, several people in the community have talked to me about is that we also bring diversity to the state, and um, that is, I think, an important piece of you know what uh, is what's important to Vermont and what I think the uh, it's not just it's international, it's domestic, uh, you know, and I think uh, it's something that we want to continue to do, and uh, I think that Vermont is embracing. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Mark. Uh, two quick things. I think I was so happy about telling our good news story. I forgot to give the uh, the very quick number. Uh, just so you're aware, we, we are operating at a loss of about eight point one million dollars for the uh, mm -hmm. for the academic year. So we're very grateful for the support and the help. Uh, they'll, they're, you know, we we all need a, a little bit of assistance as it's available, and we'll be happy to provide uh, anything that is needed to help support our case. But you know, even though it's a good news story of how well we're doing, it has been a really tough revenue hit. And I'll, and I'll end my, uh, I'll go back on mute after offering. I know, Senator Campion, that you are a, uh, a proud Bennington um, uh, associate. I would just say that Norwich University, University offers a full offering of uh, graduate programs. And if all of you would care to register, we'd love to have all of you be Norwich University alums here uh, within 18 months. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Uh, this has been incredibly helpful. The final word to committee members. You know, as these institutions open back up, uh, hopefully in the fall, I would encourage uh, all of us to get around to the ones that we don't know. Uh, visit students, visit classes, visit our presidents. Um, I think uh, it would be great. So committee members, I will see you back at 2.45. Uh, we'll, we'll continue things and thank you all. Uh, we're gonna go on a quick uh, six minute stretch and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks for making the time. Well, I don't know about everybody else, but I mean, I, I know it's a lot of information um, hearing from folks this time of year and, and learning them and what they're, they're doing, uh, et cetera. But, um, you know, I haven't been on this committee uh, for four years and I know a number of you are also new and Senator Perch, like you're returning, but uh, I certainly find it really interesting and I'm hoping other people are finding it as interesting as well, particularly in this you know, this era of COVID. Um, and it looks like, uh, you know, we'll probably make our way through some of this by early next week. Um, we'll, I'll be in contact with the Pro Tem's office and Jeff Fannin and others that will be working on some kind of remediation bill, uh, you know, in, in sort of response to COVID for our, for our schools. Happy to, and of course, everybody here will be in the loop. Um, and uh, then I think we'll start looking at other bills um, as well, or at least getting people in to hear, uh, hear from them. One thing I'm thinking about <clears throat> looking at next week, there is a bill in uh, having to do with civic education. Uh, I, um, I'd like to hear from the presenter of the bill uh, and I'd like to have a real dynamic uh, conversation about really what is civic education and what we might want to do and what we might not want to do. Um, I know there's some institutions out there uh, and some really interesting people out there who are thinking about this. I know there, I look, spent some time looking at one course, not called civic ed, but I really liked it. It's called educating for a democracy. And I thought maybe after maybe Thursday, we could spend some time um, hearing from different folks. Uh, I know there are some interesting historians out there as well who are weighing in on 
what and economists, what is it that students need to know? How can we best um, educate and prepare students to be active participants in this democracy? How do you, it's more than voting, we know that. And it's, what are the tools? And, and I'm not sure it's a test, uh, just to show my own, uh, you know, concern. I, I think it's it's more than that. I think um, certainly you need to know the, you know, history and, and government. But um, how do you really get students involved? So uh, that's just something that's on my mind, and perhaps uh, we'll do it uh, post uh, inauguration day. But moving on now, we have uh, we're going to hear from our. Uh, eyes and ears on the ground with our school board members. Uh, Sue, it's great to have you here. We know there are so many school board members who are really in so many ways, I think, the unsung heroes in this state, people that are committing their time and energy uh, to making certain our young people uh, receive the best education possible. It's an incredibly challenging job, I often think, as I'm going through the grocery store, it's one thing, uh, you know, to get pulled over quickly and quick conversation. But I always think it's the select board members and the school board members that are really <laughs> the ones who, no matter where they are, uh, it, it's it's they they just can't escape. Uh, so it's uh, we just want to recognize that uh, that level of public service is is quite incredible. So thank you for being here and we look forward to hearing uh, where things stand uh, in general, what you do, how you got to be in the position you got to be in and how we might work with you and how we will work with you going forward and then what you're seeing on the ground right now with COVID. So with that, Sue, I'll, I'll pass, pass it to you. Okay, thank you so much for having me today. Would you like me to share my screen with my written testimony? That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Can you see it? I cannot. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with your committee today about the Vermont School Boards Association, the role of school boards in Vermont's public education system, and also the COVID-19 related needs of school districts. Um, before I talk about the VSBA, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sue Saglowski. I'm the executive director of the Vermont School Boards Association, VSBA for short. And um, I grew up in Rupert, Vermont, which is in the southwestern area of the state. Beautiful and, part of the world. Yes, it is. It is a beautiful town. And um, I am a licensed attorney. I um, have worked in um, several different legal jobs, um, working for the state of Vermont um, as an assistant attorney general, but also most recently um, in private practice um, before I joined the VSBA. And um, I joined the VSBA as the Director of Legal and Policy Services. Uh, I, and, and I became very interested in doing that because I um, am a longtime school board member. Um, I, I'm, I'm not any longer a school board member, but I served for somewhere between um, 10 and 15 years. I kind of lost track along the way how many it was, but um, I served on the Meadowy School Board, the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union um, Board, um, and also on the Pollitt School Board before there was a, a, a merger that happened with Meadowy. So um, I became very um, interested and passionate about school board work. And um, that's really how I ended up at the VSBA. Um, I was in the role of director of legal and policy services for a couple of years and then um, went into the role of the executive director. So uh, let, now let me tell you a little bit about the VSBA. It is a 501c3 nonprofit organization um, and the vision of the VSBA um, is, is here in my written testimony. Um, VSBA envisions a state where every student has access to and is engaged in a world-class education 
where local boards provide student focused, and that's important, student focused oversight of education systems, and where educators, families, and communities are engaged partners, ensuring that the futures of all Vermont children are driven by their aspirations and not bound by their circumstances. And you can see uh, our, our mission is also um, set forth. We are a membership organization and our mission is to support school board members in the performance of their role and to serve as their collective voice in the public policy environment. Uh, the way we're set up is we have a 24 member board of directors, a president, an immediate past president and 22 regional representatives. There are two representatives from each of 11 regions around the state. And our current present president is Neil O'Dell of Norwich. The VSBA as a um, nonprofit is governed by bylaws, resolutions, and policies. And resolutions are positions that are taken by our, our association on in issues of importance to Vermont school boards. And they might include recommendations for actions by our own association, local school boards. Also, um, they, they may include uh, recommendations for actions by the legislature the, or the executive branch. They are guidance for staff and the VSBA board when we're working in the public policy arena. Um, so that's how when I come in and, and speak with your committee, um, most likely I'll be speaking on um, based on a resolution that has gone through the process of being proposed by one of our members and voted on at our annual meeting. And if there's um, in the absence of a resolution on a particular topic, the VSBA board itself with representatives from around the state provides guidance to the staff. The VSBA has four full-time staff whose role it is is to provide the following five services. We provide um, advocacy, um, representation in the General Assembly and in public policy development with the Agency of Education, the State Board and other education organizations. Uh, we also provide board training and support. We have um, School Board U Live, which is a comprehensive workshop on the essential work of Vermont school boards. Um, this year, we might not be able to have it live, but normally we do. Um, and then we have School Board U Digital, which is a series of monthly webinars on relevant topics of interest for our members. Um, we also provide on-site workshops, extensive webinar, web, I'm sorry, website resources, and customized board development, including board retreats. We have an annual conference and also um, regional meetings. We also provide consulting services. So we support member boards with operational or management challenges and also uh, strategic planning needs and help them with um, super superintendent searches and evaluations, strategic planning, governance transitions and um, boards that would like to use the policy governance model. We um, help them with that. Uh, fourth thing we do is communications. We provide all members with regular information updates through our website, through emails, through a quarterly newsletter, and also um, regular legislative reports. We also publish the Vermont Education Law Book. You may have seen it. It's um, a green book that has all of the education laws of Vermont um, in one book, in one location. And we publish a uh, a book called Essential Work of Vermont School Boards, which is a model for effective education governance. Um, the last service that we provide to our members is legal and policy services. And that um, is a service that provides them with consultation regarding legal questions, updates on changes to the laws and regulations, and um, training for boards and superintendents. And um, in conjunction with the Vermont School Boards Insurance Trust, which is VSBIT, the VSBA also publishes model school board policies. And we conduct policy audits as well. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of school boards. School boards are not involved in the day-to-day -day operation of schools. Their job is really to provide a high level student-focused uh, oversight and assure the delivery of an effective education program in their communities at a reasonable cost for taxpayers and in accordance with state and federal law. 
and they have six areas of responsibility at the local level. The first thing they do is engage the community to est establish a vision for the school district. They also adopt policies, hire a superintendent and ex establish clear expectations for the superintendent, develop a budget and provide financial oversight, monitor progress toward the vision that they've established with their community and operate in an ethical and effective manner. So I've told you that school board service is near and dear to my heart and to serve on a school board is really to uphold the great American tradition of a free public education for all. This tr tradition forms the foundation of our democracy, which is a well-informed citizenry. It's extremely important that students develop critical and independent thinking skills and that they understand how history can impact the future. Simply put, education is crucial and central to the future of our state and school boards play an important role in Vermont's education system. I'm gonna now move on to COVID related needs of Vermont school districts. Um, and I would first note that there are many needs and um, I'm sure your committee has heard about several needs through other witnesses. So today I'm just gonna be highlighting um, one of those needs, which is um, the school district annual meetings and budgets. And the reason I'm highlighting that is I believe you're gonna be considering um, a bill addressing the issue this week, H48. Um, right now, school boards across the state are working to finalize their budgets in preparation for warning their annual meetings. Most school district annual meetings are held in March on town meeting day. And um, as you know, the ongoing pandemic is presenting significant challenges in running safe elections, especially for those districts that vote from the floor. Under Vermont law, only a vote of the school district's voters allows a district to switch to an Australian ballot system. But um, the legislature passed Act 162 last fall, which allows a school board itself to vote to use the Australian ballot system this year um, if they normally vote from the floor at the annual meeting. And additionally, the Senate will be considering H48, which authorizes school boards to vote to move their date, um, their 2021 annual meeting date to a date later in 21, and also to require the municipal clerk to mail the Australian ballots to all of the active registered voters. We understand the General Assembly is on the course for an expedited passage of this bill. And in light of importance of this action to local school officials, um, we want to ensure the committee understands the effects of H48 on school districts, especially the provision allowing municipalities to move the date of their 2021 annual meeting. There are many school districts um, that are now in unified union districts that cross town lines and they include several towns. Um, I spoke with a school board member earlier this week from a unified district that includes nine towns and that board um, is anticipating the passage of H48. And so it's communicating with those nine towns about plans for its upcoming annual meeting and coordinating with those towns. So far, six of the nine towns um, seem to be on board to coordinate with the school district by not changing the date of their town meeting. But there are three towns that have not decided yet how they're going to proceed. So if those three towns decide to move the date of their town meetings, it raises logistical and legal questions for the school district's annual meeting. And so many in fact, uh, questions, in fact, that the school board will need to have its legal counsel attend its next meeting to ensure that it makes an informed and legal decision and prepares its warning properly. So because of the complexities involved with chain, allowing changes to the date of annual meetings, it's important um, that state officials take the lead with an organized communication strategy to encourage towns and school districts to align their votes. Clear, concise, and timely communications starting now are critically important so that school boards can consider the implications of the legislation in their preparations, which are um, happening this week and next week. VSBA provided a webinar yesterday with the help of the Secretary of State's office to provide school board members with the most up-to-date information on H48 and answer questions. Um, questions were answered for an hour and at the end there were still 32 unanswered questions which are, um, which are 
going to be answered and, and the answers will be sent out to everyone who attended the webinar. We had um, over 75 people attend the webinar. We're also working with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns to send a unified message to school boards and select boards on the importance of coordinating and aligning their annual meetings this year. This year's budget process will be uniquely challenging due to the economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We're hopeful that Vermont communities will continue their tradition of supporting public education by approving school district budgets. When the VSBA has more information about the status of school budgets um, as, the, as the voting occurs, I would be happy to come back and update the Senate Education Committee on that. In conclusion, I'd like to thank you for the op uh, opportunity to speak with your committee today. I look forward to working with you to address COVID related needs of school districts and ensure a high quality public education for every Vermont student. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Very helpful. Uh, questions or comments for Sue? Uh, Senator Perchley, please. I would just let Sue know that we passed that page 48 today. Thank you. I wrote that a couple of days ago because I was supposed to testify uh, Tuesday, I think, and then it got moved to Wednesday and then today. So yes, thank you. Yes, thank you for your flexibility, Sue. As you can tell, <laughs> I'm new to the job. You were supposed to testify Tuesday, Wednesday, and now you're on Thursday. I apologize. Yeah. I'll get it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, Senator Hooker, please. Thanks. Um, Sue, thank you for your testimony and thank you for your work. Certainly as a school board member, I agree with Senator Campion that school board members and select board members are the ones who bear the brunt of the public um, questioning. <laughs> anyway, uh, how many school boards are there in the state and how many of them belong to your association? The way that our membership is um, set up, it is by supervisory union or supervisory district. And there are 55 of those in the state and 53 of them are, are members of our association. That's great. Okay. There's roughly 800 school board members in the state individual people. This goes to Senator Lyon's comment this morning in committee when she said she's impressed with the number of volunteers we have in this state and the work that gets done by volunteers. Thank you. Absolutely. Senator Perchler? Yeah, um, not to bring up a potential source subject, but on Act 46 uh, in the interest in some new districts to allow, you know, some, some school boards wanting to leave their districts. And I just wondered, I know in the, in the past, the school board association has sometimes had a different opinion, different view on, on the consolidated districts than the superintendent's association. So I, I wondered if you had anything to say about those, those towns that are, that are trying to get out of their quote unquote forced districts. The only thing I would say at this point is um, that it is, uh, the law does allow that currently to occur. Right. Okay, so you're not, think, you don't think there's a change or a need to change the law in any, either way, either be more permissive or less permissive. Our association hasn't taken a position on that yet. That's something that the VSBA Board of Directors would need to um, consider to take a position on. Okay, thank you. Senator Chinden. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, all of the school board members out there. It is tireless work. So I just echo the comments from Chair Campion, but I wanna pick up on uh, uh, Senator Hooker's comment there. Uh, the, this volunteer work, and I, I know it well, I know all the school board members in my community have talked to others. Um, what would you say to my, my constituents out there that often comment, if not lament, uh, that when our volunteer school board members are, are negotiating for, with teachers, and again, I'm married to a teacher, I love teachers, uh, when they're negotiating with uh, teacher unions, uh, they, there seems to be an imbalance with uh, professional negotiating experience. 
Do you have a, a, a position on the SBEA, of, of, sorry, the school board, is it SBEA or your initials? My apologies if I got your acronym. The SBA. The SBA. Um, uh, what is your yeah. general thoughts on how active, involved, and how much, is there enough support for school board members to feel like they are negotiating as, as best they possibly can when it comes to working with teachers, teachers unions, and finding a fair and equitable deal for uh, of working conditions for our very important educators in the state? That's a, a very good question. Um, they, that's definitely a, uh, an area of focus for the VSBA and we do um, provide collective bargaining supports. Um, so yes, we're, we're aware of the need for sure. Sue, um, do all school board members take the training? Is there a training once people get elected? Is there a process there and, and is that something everybody participates in and that might cover you know ethical behavior all that kind of thing or is it optional it is optional uh, for new board members we do provide a, a new board member training um, and not all new board members um, take part in it there is a certain amount of training that is required for um, board chairs to do with their superintendent by law I believe that's eight hours but not for every board member. So folks know, you know, uh, senators know there's a situation in Bennington now, you may be aware of Sue, where there, a board member has said uh, a number of horrible, horribly racist, uh, derogatory comments. Um, and uh, there's no way at this point to uh, remove that board member because it's not, it's neither in the bylaws nor is it in the, uh, the charter, which I think would need to be changed. So, so the community has struggled with this. It looks as though because of timing, it might not, there might not be anything that can be done uh, and that it might just have to wait and go to the voters, which is tragic given, you know, a lot of these comments are directed at children uh, and, you know, he's there to, uh, to help and assist. And so it's, <clears throat> it's just something that, you know, I, I guess I'm not, I guess the one thing I'm wondering is if whether or not your association has taken a position on this and and actually more importantly are you a resource for the school board members that have been trying to find a solution which might as I said be removal are you that kind of resource that might be the better question when there's an issue like that can people call on all of you for legal advice to work directly with the legislature to help move something along, et cetera. Yes, we are a resource and we, um, we actually have, we have a book um, that I mentioned, The Essential Work of School Boards. And in that book, we have a um, set out a process that boards can use to deal with um, challenging behavior of a board member. Um, so I often provide that, I, I provide that to board members um, when they contact me with questions um, that are you know, similar to the one that you're referring to. Um, there is no uh, way for them to easily remove a board member, um, mm -hmm. but there are um, possibilities of censorship and things like that. Um, so the process sets out, it's a very clear process that we've set out. I'd be happy to share it with you. Have you been in contact with, with the school districts down here? Have they been in contact with you looking for assistance in this regard? Yes. School board members. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Good. Uh, Senator Hooker? Yeah, um, going back to H48, you know, we did pass that bill today and you, you, your testimony suggested that there were a number of questions and I've heard from some school board members as well. Um, does the association support the change uh, and is the association working with those municipalities to um, get them to sync with uh, the dates so that things are a little um, more consistent. Yes, we are working with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns to get out a unified um, message the, with the two organizations to uh, select boards and school boards to encourage um, them to work together as much as they possibly can. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the um, 
$2 million that has been set aside to um, pay for the mailing of ballots. And um, the way to make efficient use of that money is to make sure that, um, that their towns and the school districts are coordinating. So yes, we are definitely working on that. We're hoping to um, you know, hear, hear some messages coming out um, from the state level um, to that effect as well. Okay, thank you. Sue, are you involved with recruiting at all? I mean, it's not a party, for example, affiliated office. Um, does your organization look to recruit people to run for the school board? We don't necessarily look to recruit them, but we, um, we definitely uh, let, look to educate people about um, school board service and um, what it entails and how important it is in, and in hopes that they will become um, interested in running. It's a hard sell, a lot of work for no pay and people are always mad at you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you advertise it that way, Senator Chittenden? <laughs> <laughs> Senator Lyons. Yes, uh, underpaid and overworked. <laughs> uh, although I really enjoyed my school board work uh, when I was there. But the, one, of the, one of the things that's sort of been mentioned and I think is an interesting point of conversation is the relationship between the school and the municipality and how in different places, there's a very close working relationship, and then in others, there's not. And what is, since the consolidation in Act 46, have you seen a change in that in any way? Um, is, there a, is there a move to greater uh, cooperation or less? Um, just curious. I don't know that I could really uh, answer that question generally. I think it is um, specific, you know, different areas of the state may have different things going on. So um, it's, that's a difficult question to answer. Any other final questions for Sue? Sue, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to continuing to partner with you. Uh, and uh, I know you'll keep us updated on things and certainly appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So I see our, our uh, final uh, uh, witness uh, has arrived, which is terrific. Holly, how are you? I'm doing great, Senator. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Uh, one of the things I know Senator Perchlick has been involved in, I know uh, the topic has come up in this committee uh, for a long time and that is after school programs, after school programming, um, and uh, what that looks like in this state, what are some of the possibilities. Um, and Holly, I got to know a little bit, it was four or five years ago when I was on this committee, and I know she was advocating for after school programs then, and I'm grateful that you're continuing to do that work today. So what I thought we might do, Holly, is, is just, I, I for one could benefit, would benefit from a, a broad overview of after school here in the state of Vermont. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's universal. Uh, and, and, you know, where is it? Uh, how is it doing? Some of the benefits of it. Um, and uh, also I'd like to hear what's happening, you know, with regard to COVID in after school. And then I think the final thing I'll just mention, it, it ties into everything, and that's we've been talking about how, and this is not the right expression, uh, it's not a winners or losers, but there are, there are families and individuals that have been much more negatively impacted from COVID than others. And those are the families and young people that we really need to work on, uh, work with, work, work for. Uh, recognize and, and help. Uh, and so I'd like you to just keep that in mind as well as it relates to, to after school and, and how you might play a role in that kind of work. So with that, uh, Holly Morehouse, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, this is my favorite time of day. The hours of three to 6 p.m. are the after school hours. I know you have all had a long day, so I'm hoping we can have some fun together um, in the next 30 minutes or so, uh, looking at some data, seeing what young people are saying about mental health, thinking about youth engagement and youth involvement and uh, planning a path forward. Um, I am uh, 
the executive director of Vermont After School. Uh, that is, uh, it's a statewide nonprofit that's been around for about 11 plus years. Uh, we work with about 450 or so after school, summer, youth serving organizations across the state, uh, children um, from kindergarten through 12th grade and often uh, beyond. And um, as a statewide after school network, uh, we have been nationally recognized for the professional development we, we provide to the field for our initiatives around science, technology, engineering, and math in Vermont, around our initiatives in the out of school space around social emotional learning. We have also been internationally recognized for our work on youth voice and primary prevention. Um, so we have a lot to work on and a lot um, has happened um, in the last uh, 10 plus years in Vermont. Um, I don't know if it was intentional in addition to being in the after school time uh, space on your committee schedule, uh, but it was also really interesting to listen to the state colleges. Um, just as one sort of starting point connection, uh, Robert Putnam in his 2015 book, Our Kids, um, shared a, uh, about a project uh, that found that uh, youth who were involved in extracurricular activities and after school programs on a regular basis um, in high school were 70% more likely to go on to college than their peers who were not involved. There are so many connections between early childhood, K-12 education and higher ed that after school is that glue um, across all those connections. The other piece, uh, Senator Campion, when you mentioned um, wanting to be the education state. You know, over a decade of research in after school has shown that we will never make progress in becoming an education state or addressing the academic achievement gap or really meeting the needs of our students if we don't take into account the time outside the school day and over the summer. Um, it happens on a number of levels. We have parents who contact us all the time. They want to live in communities that have programs they need to live in communities because they need to work, they need after school programs, they need summer learning programs. They know that that's what helps get their children ahead and helps them get into college, helps them find career paths forward. Um, and as we have seen very starkly throughout COVID, that communities that had strong after school programs, strong summer programs, strong uh, youth serving organizations that could partner with the schools were the ones that were able to offer so many more resources. And we're gonna look at what some of those resources were, so many more resources, you know, from food to academic support to childcare. And we have other parts of their state that would, because they don't have those players in their community, um, really um, saw great disparities um, in what they could provide. And um, so that, that learning point. The last piece I wanna to tag to is when you talk about civic engagement, I would say after school programs in Vermont are leading the way on youth voice. Um, uh, they are using models of youth councils, participatory budgeting, putting dollars in the hands of young people to make decisions about uh, what positive change looks like in their community. So um, when you have those conversations, I, I hope that you will um, take into account that work. There is also a, a bill that um, some young people have been working on uh, with Representative Lamphere to create a statewide youth council. Um, and I think that that ties well to um, goals around civic engagement. Um, I have some documents uh, that I uh, wanted to share and um, Senator Campion, is it okay if I share my screen? Please. Uh, the first, First of these is, a, is really a background. If you're new to the issue of after school, um, this uh, resilience and strengthening families document gives you some of the basic data. It connects to a larger report uh, that we put out uh, in 2019. Uh, but really the takeaway from this is that access to after school programs is really a cross cutting issue. It's one of those issues where you invest in one program and you hit economic issues with working families, you hit education issues with the achievement gap and summer learning loss, you hit prevention issues um, with substance misuse and risky behaviors, you hit food issues by providing access for, uh, to healthy food and snacks for children and youth, you hit um, mental health issues, self-esteem, workforce development. It really is one of those spaces. Uh, part of what makes it such a powerful space is that it is a 
it's a creative space. Um, and it's this mix of education, uh, guidance, counselor, learning, childcare, positive youth development. It's about taking uh, students out into the community, bringing the community in um, into the programs. Um, so it's really a rich, a rich uh, space um, to look at education and, and well-being uh, for, for youth. Um, so this uh, initial document covers like some of the key data points um, and, and each of those areas. Um, actually the uh, legislative working group that Senator Campy and I were on together uh, did a return on investment study that you see noted here um, with support from the National Conference of State Legislatures um, at that time. Uh, that study has been replicated nationally um, and you'll see some of the recommendations um, at that time, including this connection to the Vermont Youth Declaration of Rights, which was done through after school programs and this uh, elevating and amplifying uh, of youth voice. The second document um, that I uh, wanted to share for some background information, uh, does it show when I just flip over to the next document? Are you looking at a document that says America after three? Uh, yes. Vermont, okay. Vermont after three, yes. Vermont after three, thanks. Yes. So this is part of a study, um, and I'm sharing this here because this is very recent data. It came out in December uh, 2020, and this is a national study that's done every five to six years uh, by the After School Alliance. It's based on a parent survey, and they also do enough surveying um, in their methodology so that they can have state-specific reports for every state. A um, couple of things to notice in this report. Um, one, Vermont for the second time in a row uh, ranks in the top 10 in the nation uh, for our after school programming. I mean, that is something to celebrate. Um, we, um, we rank in the top 10 for these numbers I'm gonna show you at the top of the second page. Um, safe environment, high level of parent satisfaction, 96% of parents saying that their after school programs have knowledgeable and caring staff. Um, we still um, have great need. About 39% uh, percent of children and youth who are not currently in programs would be in a uh, program this afternoon. It's over 26,000 students. So in these hours that we're sitting in right now, uh, 26,000 students in Vermont would be in programs this afternoon um, if more were available, accessible, and affordable. You'll see that that is actually an increase when you look at the bar chart in red, orangey red over here from 2014. Um, in 2014, we were ranked fourth in the nation. In um, 2020, we were ranked ninth in the nation. So still in the top 10, but, but some decrease because um, there are a few worrying numbers. Uh, another number that I want uh, to draw to your attention is this number in the bottom in the center, 14% of children in after school who are from low income households. So top 10 in the nation for the quality of our programming, we know how to do after school programming well here in Vermont. However, we were 51st in this national study because DC was in the mix. 51st in the nation for the percentage of children enrolled in after school programs who are from low income households. We have a real issue around access. And I'm gonna take you to the last page to look at these three bars on the left. Because I asked parents, so what, what are the barriers to participation? And three barriers came to the top. Lack of available programs. We have areas of the state um, that either do not have any after school programs, they do not have any summer programs, or they have a few and there's long waiting lists so you can't get into them. There's, there, there just isn't enough to meet the need. Programs are too expensive was the highest barrier. Um, and I think that that ties to that number that we just look at, looked at about access, uh, especially for low income uh, families. And then the third is around uh, transportation. No way to get children to and from programs. So those three issues, Senator Campy, if you remember, they're very similar to the issues we looked at five, six years ago. Right? There's areas of the state that are underserved. Um, there are barriers around cost. And now this new one's sort of rising to the top around transportation. Um, so um, there's some other numbers in here to look at. There's a lot of support. It's a bipartisan, tripartisan issue uh, to support after school. And uh, you know, Vermont in this last year in 2020 has made um, 
some really important progress, um, including uh, the governor's initiative for universal access to after school, as well as the task force uh, that Senator Perchlick and I um, are serving on. The, um, the third piece is, is my testimony and, and I'm, I gave it to you so you have, you have it written down, you have my thoughts there, but I really wanna hit on, um, on some, some overviewing areas. I wanna talk about the highs during COVID. I wanna talk about what we saw in some of the lows. I wanna make note of the progress we made as a state since March, really addressing after school and out of school time. And then I wanna draw attention to the continuing challenges um, that we see. The, um, the highs really are covered in these first two pages. And uh, where it comes from is the way that the field stepped forward. I mean, taking you back to March, you know, schools had to quickly go remote and they had to close their buildings. Um, and there was for a while this misunderstanding that after school programs just no longer existed because school wasn't happening in the same way. That was not true. After school programs morphed and changed and stepped up in so many different uh, creative ways. Uh, they became resources for families, providing information about unemployment, access to food, mental health services, they stepped forward to provide childcare for essential workers. Um, they uh, expanded their hours um, to meet the needs of working families, even while schools were offering less in person. Uh, over the summer, when a number of school, uh, school buildings uh, continued to be closed, uh, they found alternative places to hold summer programs. And it really was this after school field that stepped forward. Uh, to meet the needs of um, summer. And that was coming from this place of uh, students have already missed three months by then, right? Of in-person learning, we're already falling behind. We couldn't wait another three months, <laughs> right? To bring them back into safe spaces. Um, and so working very closely uh, with the Department of Health, finding ways to run summer programs. Um, communities that were able to have programs running summer programs also were a step ahead when it came to school reopening. Uh, because they had professionals who had already been working with the COVID health and safety guidelines for months and bringing children into common spaces and working with staff and families about those procedures. And some of them will even talk about how it was teaching the students the mindsets of how to be in a common space, right, under the COVID guidelines safely. Schools and communities that had those programs in place were able to um, to start from a, a point of strength, right? When it came back to reopening schools in the fall. Um, access to food was very important. Uh, many after school providers uh, moved on to the school food distribution teams. They were on the buses uh, delivering meals. They put together take home kits for STEM or arts uh, with activities and supplies that went home to children and youth. They created virtual programming opportunities uh, sometimes they were for teens just to get together and connect on Google or Zoom or FaceTime. Sometimes they were outdoor activities that sent kids outside in their backyard and then they'd come back and share uh, really creative and how they were connecting. Um, a lot of attention as well from the professionals um, in the field around the social emotional needs and how to combat the loneliness, isolation uh, that um, young people have been feeling um, throughout the pandemic. Also, a lot of attention of how to create things like youth councils and uh, we have engineering clubs that are running right now that really get at youth agency. How do we increase youth agency in this time where so many youth feel stressed and, and helpless? Um, really important uh, piece of the puzzle. Those are some of the, the highs. Um, some of the lows. Um, well, the disparities, I will say. <laughs> um, you had parts of our state, when you look at September, um, where schools, elementary schools in particular, were in person five days a week, maybe to 11 or maybe sometimes 1 p.m. And then an after-school partner was running after-school programming until four or five in the evening. So if you were a family living in one of those communities up in the Northeast Kingdom or the Windsor area, you had programming five days a week between school and after school, almost for a full work day. Um, further south, many of the school buildings were closed. Um, there weren't as many 
uh, after school partners in that area to begin with. And um, there were communities where families had absolutely nothing as far as resources for their children um, around in-person instruction and support. Um, you know, the disparities really uh, were painful um, to see. Um, another kind of low um, was something that developed in our state, I would say, um, and I think as an education committee, this difference between school day teachers and after school professionals um, and how we view them and how we talk about those fields, those two different groups of professionals. Um, the, um, when, as I said, when schools could not open, uh, when there were remote learning days, um, it were the after school professionals who stepped into those spaces um, when teachers could not be in the classroom with their children. Uh, when um, after Thanksgiving weekend or after the winter holidays, when uh, schools were concerned about having enough teachers to have staffing or um, because people had wanted to travel or visit family or so forth, um, you know, they turned to the after school programs to see if they could run programming <laughs> um, and make sure that they didn't travel and so forth. So, um, you know, anytime that we're providing supports uh, for our teachers around testing or vaccinations, I think we really need to be thinking about this youth serving uh, field as well, uh, because they are playing such an important role um, in so many uh, different ways. Um, I think the other challenge um, has been the, uh, the cost of programs. Um, capacity has been lowered. It was about 50% over the, over the summer um, compared to pre-COVID as far as having capacity to serve students um, in summer programs. Um, in the fall, that picked up um, um, in some key areas, especially where students could come, come back in either through the remote learning hubs that the governor's initiative set up, the child care hubs, um, or through partnerships with their school. Um, however, um, even the child care hubs uh, initiative that the state put out, it, it only allowed for operating costs for the first month. And the assumption was that parents would pick up the cost of uh, tuition or participation fees after that first month. Um, sometimes you had a parent uh, taking a child to a school that is their main school on a remote learning day in the same building with some of the same staff, but because it was a remote learning day, the parent had to pay, right, for the care and support in that same school building. Um, and for parents to pick up, you know, six extra hours of care up to 30 extra hours of care um, was quite, quite a high burden. Um, so I'm hoping that as we move forward and we look at the winter and spring and the needs of families and the reduced uh, school schedules and, um, and you know, who and how we're going to pick up that slack, um, that we can shift them of that burden more towards state and, and federal dollars instead of having it fall on, on parents. Um, progress, uh, great progress, I would say in our state. I'm very proud of the state level of collaboration uh, between the Child Development Division, the Department of Health, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, um, especially around the hubs, those child care hubs. I have not in my 20 plus years in Vermont seen such rapid and um, deep level of collaboration to, to stand up a support and an emergency um, system for working families and for students, um, as I saw with that state level of, of collaboration. Um, we also, as a state, I think, started um, recognizing that child care doesn't, child care needs don't end at age five when they go to kindergarten, right? We really started to understand that child care needs continues throughout the elementary years. Um, and really, I would say middle school. Um, some of our initiatives didn't go all the way up to seventh and eighth grade. And that's really when you want kids, right, <laughs> in supervised and supportive programming with caring adults. Um, not engaging in risky behavior. So, so really thinking um, broader and more connected about our, um, our, our child care needs. Um, the continuing challenges, you know, many of the supports that Vermont put in place, such as the child care hubs with the uh, CRF dollars, has ended in December. Um, we still have programs that are not fully back. We do not have any more funding uh, for, for hubs uh, through that uh, that funding source. 
Um, we also did not as a state help cover places, as I mentioned, where after school programs had to expand their hours um, and didn't receive any additional funding to do that. So maybe instead of running from three to six, they were now running from one to six or 11 to five or something. Um, so many of them are burning through their budgets quicker in the year um, and have talked about maybe having to end and not make it all the way through the school year as a program. So that's an, another thing to watch for. I, um, I wanted to tag also as we look forward, um, I want to stop sharing for a second and then um, I wanna share, this is, um, Am I sharing? I lost your faces. I hate when that happens. Uh, How go. about that? There you All go. right. Um, Vermont After School has partnered with five communities and researchers from Iceland on the Vermont Youth Project. Uh, Iceland has uh, a probably the strongest global model on primary prevention. And we're in a five-year memorandum of agreement with them. And um, our second year of data uh, we just collected um, seventh through 12th graders just last October. And in the survey this year in those five communities, uh, two of which are in Rutland County, um, for the senators from Rutland County, um, we um, added COVID specific data questions. And I think this is some of the only survey data I've seen in Vermont yet uh, directly from our youth. And I wanna draw it to your attention as an education committee. Um, this first chart that I'm sharing, um, you'll see it's got seventh and eighth grade um, on one end, ninth and 10th in the middle, 11th and 12th on the right. Uh, the green bars are for um, the, this is for the total for all five communities. These are where students answered that things have gotten a little or a lot better. The yellow bars are no change. And then the aqua light blue bars are where students said it's a bit worse or a lot worse. This first chart is about um, how COVID has affected school connections. You will say, see that about half of our high schoolers are saying um, school connections are a bit worse or a lot worse under COVID. Um, on the next slide, I wanna share, uh, this is a, specifically about mental health. Um, asking them in what ways has COVID affected uh, their mental health? Um, once again, you'll see particularly for ninth through 12th graders, 45, 46% of students have said that it has gotten worse um, since COVID. Uh, how has it affected their educational experience, um, including their interaction with teacher and classmates, uh, particularly 11th and 12th graders, almost 60% say it has gotten worse. Uh, about 50% of the 9th and 10th graders have said it has gotten worse. Uh, this chart is around loneliness. How did it affect your level of loneliness? Once again, um, over half of our 11th and 12th graders have said it, loneliness has gotten worse. Feeling anxious, once again, all of our high schools, about 50% um, are naming that they feel more anxious. Um, this is just a subset of that data collected from the fall, uh, but it's really telling um, and it's quite real. Um, which brings me back to my final recommendations. Um, when we look at how to move forward in 2021 and 2022, I hope that we look at educational supports in a very broad lens. I hope that we talk not only about learning loss, but we talk about mental health and social emotional learning. I hope that we talk not only about what schools can do, but what about after school programs, youth serving in organizations, summer programs, and all those wraparound services can do in this mix. Um, at the end of my report, I've noted three of the federal funding sources, the new ESSER relief dollars, um, that all of these three can be used for childcare and or after school and education. I'm hoping that as a state, we'll be able to leverage some of those dollars I hope in winter and spring, we can meet the needs on remote learning days, the expanded after school hours that are needed right now for our students and for our working families. I hope that we can do a summer learning summit that pulls all these partners together and make this summer, the summer about community connection 
and learning. That is what our young people need. We need six to eight weeks of full summer programming and we need to be moving on that now. And as we move into next fall, I'm hoping that these supports around social emotional learning, youth voice, youth um, agency, youth advocacy, uh, continue to be themes, you know, as we move towards becoming the education state and, and we don't lose those pieces. Um, so I will pause there and um, take questions or I'd love to hear comments on what you're thinking thank, as well. Thank you, Holly. I, I just wanna kick it off by saying, you know, we, we've asked, uh, Jeff Fannin to, of the NEA to kind of start to gather folks a little bit uh, and look at the issue of remediation. You know, this is sort of post COVID um, remediation and, and, and broadly speaking, you know, what may, might students have missed? Uh, what do we need to be doing? Uh, mental health issues, the range of things. And so rather than all of us talk in our silos uh, and each of us go to sort of each, you know, each committee with a presentation, I'm hoping to have Jeff uh, kind of take the lead on this talk. I know he's reaching out to the Superintendents Association, the Principals Association, uh, others. And I think you should just be a part of that. And I would, I would just recommend reaching out to him. You know, how can after school, uh, how does after school fit into this? Um, you know, what does a summer look like now? We're hopefully might be leaving COVID in some regards, or even if we're not, how does after school uh, play a role in, in working with folks, uh, with young people? The other thing I, I just want to mention, and that's uh, one of my interests is literacy. And, uh, you know, one, one principal did say to me not long ago, you know, you could put a kid in an, and he wasn't talking specifically about, I think, after school, pro, but well, let's take the summer. You know, you can put the kid in to a summer program for four weeks, but unless that person knows how to teach literacy, really has the tools, it, it, it really, it's not gonna make the difference you want it to make. So again, I would just, uh, I, you, you may be doing this. Uh, I'm just putting out, it out there that, you know, working to make certain that your folks have those tools so that, um, you know, I could read to my nieces and nephews for four weeks. It might make a difference. I would think it would. But to teach literacy, reading and writing, I would think those are what's out there and um, just to get the, the, the best uh, to your folks. I agree. I think that goes for literacy. I think it goes for STEM. Um, sure. And, you know, there's two, two approaches. You know, one is there is power in after-school programs or summer programs being closely connected to the school day. Like that's been proven in the research. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, sometimes teachers are teaching in after-school, um, but it doesn't mean that all the teachers have to be teaching there, but communicating with staff. This is what the youth are working, right? These are what my students are working on. You know, here's what I'm seeing. Here's are the, here are the pieces. And then in after-school, they can, they can take those and use hands-on learning and, and other creative ways to, to get at those same concepts. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we found uh, over COVID is even when we offer dollars, like through the hubs program, not every school wants to run after school and not every school wants to run right. summer programming. They didn't want to, they wanted somebody else to. Right. So I think that we need to be careful of not following the assumptions that they all do. <laughs> um, and to make sure that we set up systems for universal access that allows for that flexibility and diversity and then strengthens those connections, right? So that we don't have some programs that are really good at literacy because they have the teachers in it and some that are weaker, but really we've, we've managed to put in those, those different, different layers. Yes, Senator Lyons, please. So Holly, uh, Holly thank you uh, very much. Um, I think your day is probably as long as ours has been, but uh, one of the one of the things that I greatly appreciate about after school is it really means out of school, and you know, so it, it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be affiliated with an educational institution, and I think that makes a, a huge difference, and and also. The, the models that you bring to us with parent and community involvement, which is so uh, terrific in other countries, 
And I'm just wondering what, um, what community members, organizations, and groups have stepped up to fill in some of the gaps, perhaps where the school isn't interested? That's a great question. So um, the most relevant data I would say is both from the summer and from the child care hubs. Um, the, where we saw, we saw established after school programs and community organizations like King Street Center or Sarah Holbrook Center, right? Who are, who are already working with youth, right? They, they stepped into that space. We saw uh, parks and recreation departments um, move into that space. That's a whole nother agency, right? They were working with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, not Agency of Ed, not Child Care Division. Um, and all of a sudden it was like, whoa, over the summer, we got to connect to them as well and get them connected to the Department of Health and how to do this well. So, and they continued throughout the fall um, to, to fit into that space. Um, we saw a number of arts organizations um, really expand their programming and offer full day uh, camps both in the summer and um, throughout the fall. Um, we did not see, we had a number of employers contact us, um, you know, hospitals and other large employers feeling that they wanted a child care center or an after school program or a remote learning day hub in their building and maybe they had a space. But as we got further into those conversations, they actually like didn't want to run it themselves. You know, they wanted the Y to come in or somebody else to come in and, and run it. And um, then it became tricky uh, because to set something up for a remote learning day, that as soon as the students went back to school, transportation was going to become an issue, right? Of how you get them from the school to the business, um, it created some other logistics. So, um, so those didn't didn't pan out in in the same way. Um, who else stepped into that space? There were some uh, private providers of youth programming, uh, gymnastics studios, fitness centers, martial arts, um, who also expanded um, um, their program offerings. And it, so it was a very, of course, a very Vermont, <laughs> very um, intricate sort of who's in the community and who can leverage libraries are another space that were leveraged uh, during COVID. Um, and I would say are, are really strong partners in this out of school time space because you're absolutely right, Senator, that it's it's after school, it's weekends, it's summer, it's in service days, it's school vacation days, it's it's really any time outside of school. Um, so it's really a variety. Another lesson we learned was um, we had a community where the school partnered with one partner to offer programming on remote learning days at free or very low cost, um, and that actually hurt some of these other providers who were having to charge because they had families signed up for remote learning days to work with them. And then once this low cost option came in, families shifted over. And then some of those providers were actually in danger of having to close or lay off employees and so forth. So um, because it's a complicated and diverse landscape, we have to be really careful with how we implement solutions for sure. Thank you, thanks. And, and thank you for all your work. The, 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 what you've accomplished over the a very short time, relatively speaking, has been uh, really outstanding. So thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you for your interest. Um, on the, the broader like community-based models, um, that Vermont Youth Project I mentioned and where this data came from about the mental health and the, the sites are in Rutland and Franklin County. Um, I just wanna name some of the players that are at that table are hospitals, um, pediatricians, mental health providers, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Club, uh, prevention networks, uh, town aldermen, select boardmen, uh, mayor, uh, police and sheriff departments. Um, and I would say some that that project in particular in my head is really those five communities trying to take what we see in Iceland and Finland and the best of the best in Vermont and how do we make our communities and the built environment around youth the best places for young people to grow up. And um, third space out of school time is a key component of every one of those discussions. Senator Perksoff, did you wanna add something? I saw you unmute yourself and I know you've been on this committee for uh, for a while now. Yeah, I wanted to well, reiterate the thanks to Holly and the, her 
organization for just bringing raising the the level of knowledge of after school in the state and and working tirelessly to promote it and and you know it was kind of a new even though we talked about it last term in this committee i was being on the task force and having to look at some of the research and what others are doing that uh it came to come to really appreciate how valuable it is and if we want these kind of self-actualizing youth and good citizens that we talk about civics or we talk about just uh things like literacy or other academics after school just is extremely important and whether it be something like tutoring or other activities that that it's just incredibly important to 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 provide the the well-rounded individuals that we want to be the leaders in, in the future so I, i've become a real evangelical uh, proponent of after school programs at this point so no questions but just wanted to say that so can I ask uh, another yes, question? Please, please, of course. So, yeah, and it was triggered by uh, Senator Perchlick, but um, it, so all of the all of the great things that are going on, and it's it sounds like uh, some of a lot of these programs uh, are different depending on where we are in the state. But your goal is to become to have this fall into place as an ongoing system. When are we? I mean, do you feel that there's any seamlessness that's been developed? Is it self-perpetuating at all at this point? I mean, there's a lot of energy that you and others are putting into keeping whatever programs are in place going and, uh, and developing new. Do you feel that uh, any of this is becoming sort of community perpetuated? That is a fun question. I do. <laughs> I, um, a few things. I, um, we do have common standards around quality um, and what a quality program looks like. And that took a lot of years to get to. And there's a lot of buy-in about what quality looks like and, and what kind of training staff need. And we have a very strong network across providers. Um, I mean, early on in COVID, we had open calls every single day and they had lots of people on them, you know, and, and talking and sharing. Um, we have places in our state that have had strong programs for so long that I don't think families can imagine not having them, you know, if they were to go away. Now, most of those or many of those are funded through federal dollars. Um, and they, um, and they have, uh, for instance, like the 21st Century Community Learning Center grants, which are big five-year grants. And we have places in the state that have had those for 15 plus years at every single one of their schools. And, and so it's really strong and ingrained there. Um, I think um, the other piece where I see, I think we've done a really great job at um, making people want to have programs. Um, and, um, and a couple of data points on that, when the legislature um, put uh, $600,000, it was in 2018, of the tobacco settlement funding, put that aside for access to after school and summer learning programs. Uh, Vermont After School worked with the Child Development Division uh, around um, granting those dollars out. So we had $600,000 to grant out over two years. And we received over 100 requests and the the amount of money um, requested was about $5.5 million for that $600,000. And the requests were coming in from homeless shelters and science museums and um, churches and schools and all different kinds of players in different communities and communities that I hadn't even heard of that I had to look up and that see this need and wanted to move forward. We had, um, some additional money just in this past December of 2020 to run a smaller competition. We had about 60,000 left from the state that wasn't used under COVID. And then we, uh, the community, Vermont Community Foundation gave us an additional $50,000. So we had $110,000 and we're like, let's, let's run a competition. The CRF money's ending, let's get this out. It was a quick turnaround. I think it was like 10 days or something. And we received 84, applications uh, with requests over $900,000 for the $110,000. The need is there, right? Like we have done a really good job at raising awareness, um, 
people seeing what they, knowing what they need and, 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 and communities moving to try to do it, where they're getting stuck is in who pays for it. Who owns it? Do the schools pay for it? Do the parents pay for it? Do the town pay for it? How do we pay for this cost? And it's, a, it's really a, an ownership question too that we also have in our state. We're having now, you know, where does it sit? Does it sit with the Agency of Education? Does it sit with Child Development Division? Is it a health issue? Is it, right? So I think that's, you know, those are some of the questions we need to, to answer. Um, but yes, I absolutely see um, strong, strong leaders, uh, great quality standards, places that can't imagine not having after school and lots of hunger and interest and places that don't yet have it. Um, we're, we're really poised um, to, to solve this problem. And I'm so excited to work with all of you in this biennium on it. Great. Thank you, Holly, and thank you uh, for joining us today. And you'll reach out to Jeff Fannin. Uh, that would be great. Um, and, uh, and you'll keep us posted also on ways that, of course, that we can partner with you. I don't know if there are any actual bills in at this point related to after school, but I certainly know that you'll be on your way down to appropriations to talk about these things. And um, we'll be working closely with the appropriations committee to help guide their work, so thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. And in the spirit of after school, everybody needs recess <laughs> and a healthy snack. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Well, great, so uh, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. I appreciate the questions, the conversation. Tomorrow we are, as you know, jumping into the world of ed funding with uh, joint fiscal uh, with Treasurer Pierce and then uh, we'll have a break and we'll move on to broadband, uh, an update from uh, Commissioner Tierney. Uh, two things that are gonna be coming up next week that I believe one of which uh, Jude sent to everybody and the other, I believe Senator Perchlick sent, those are two, uh, two reports, one on the waiting study, which we'll, we'll hear from uh, folks next week on that. Um, and the other is the Select Committee on Higher Education. We have about an hour and a half next week um, where we will have the consultant, Brian Prescott, in with Senator Bruce and uh, President Joyce Judy talking to us about their work and uh, their findings and update us a little bit on, on things from their end. Any so questions, please? Yes, Jeannie. Just a reminder to uh, name oh. or elect a clerk. Elect a clerk. Yes, Senator Perslick, is that why your hand was up? Because you wanted to volunteer? Uh, I'd be happy to be the clerk, but I had another thing to mention. Please go ahead. And I thought I'd mention it today in, instead of uh, tomorrow when Commissioner Tierney is here, just to folks know that Commissioner Tierney is my boss in my day job. Um, so just, uh, I work at the Department of Public Service. I don't have anything to do with broadband. I work for the Clean Energy Development Fund, but it is uh, housed within the Department of Public Service. Thanks for that heads up. And I, I probably should have given folks uh, a heads up yesterday that my boss, uh, President uh, Walker, was going to be here today. It's, it's a small state. Uh, we all wear multiple hats, uh, especially in order to, you know, to suit our interests and as well as to, uh, you know, just get things done. So I appreciate that heads up. Uh, and on the, the note of clerk, is there, I, I don't, I, I honestly, I don't want to force anybody into this position. Um, the clerk uh, takes the role, the clerk, um, uh, or, you know, t uh, records votes. Um, I suspect if something were to happen to uh, myself and Senator Hooker, the clerk, no, I guess it's the ranking member would, would pick up uh, where we leave off. Um, Senator Persley, is that? Yeah, no, I, I, I'd be happy to do it as the one returning member, although you don't need to be returning to be the, the clerk. And oh, it seems like sometimes it's something they stick with one of the new newbies, but I'm I'm almost a newbie, so I'm happy to do it. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, yes, Senator Hooker. I'm going to nominate Senator Chittenden because I nominated Senator Taranzini in health and welfare. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy that Senator Perchlick has volunteered in that spirit of volunteerism yeah, that's terrific. so strong in this state. <laughs> and I think, what is it, like a thousand bucks you get? I don't remember what the clerk gets. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, it's down that much. I thought it was like five. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough time. <laughs> if you need right. any help, Senator Perchlick, I'm happy to co-clerk with you. Ah, there you go. <laughs> That's right. If, if, if he's absent, we know who to, to call on. Yeah. Thank you all. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow uh, and have a great evening. <laughs>